Good afternoon and welcome to Bright Talk. My name is Daniel Norman. I'm a research analyst at the ISF and today I'm going to be taking the listeners through how to run effective cybersecurity exercises. So we've seen in the media that cyber attacks are steadily increasing over the last, uh, last few years and therefore organizations are constantly under threat with over two thirds experiencing data breaches in 2017. So consequently, cybersecurity preparedness and resiliency are becoming increasingly important to the protection of an organization's information. And one way of improving this ability to handle cyber attacks is by running cybersecurity exercises. But before I start, perhaps a bit of information about the organization that I work for, uh, the Information Security Forum, for those on the line who aren't entirely sure who we are. So the ISF uh, turns 30 this year. Um, we are a not-for-profit, member-driven organization that addresses key issues in information risk management through our research, our tools, and our uh, platforms for promoting networking amongst the, uh, the membership. So, as I alluded to there, the ISF security model, we are split into three. So, our, our key areas are research and reports covering topics um, around risk management, information security, and cyber security. We have tools and methodologies such as our information risk um, uh, methodology, our benchmark, and our uh, uh, development of our quantitative risk methodology. And our third element is our knowledge exchange, the, the platform, as I alluded to, for members to engage with each other and share good or best practice. The agenda for today, though, is going to be predominantly spent on introducing what cybersecurity exercises are um, and what the actual need for businesses is to run them, the benefits of running these exercises, and then I'm going to spend the bulk of the presentation uh, taking you through the ISF approach to running cybersecurity exercises and the kinds of roles and responsibilities of, of individuals involved. Um, and then I will wrap this up by giving uh, five minutes an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have any questions on the line, please um, enter them into the screen and I will endeavor to, to answer them towards the end of the presentation. So the business problem. Security leaders that we have interviewed during our research process are concerned about the amount of cyber attacks that, that are happening day in, day out. And many organizations that we have spoken to are feel as though they are wholly unprepared for the onset of a real life cyber attack. Exercises are difficult to, to explain what they are really. The, um, they can take a number of forms with, with our research revealing that there is no real common definition. So it's, it's difficult for organizations to, to decide the most appropriate type of exercise to perform. Um, but in doing so and completing these types of exercises, they need to evaluate their level of ability to handle cyber attacks, which is one of the key takeaways when organizations actually complete these exercises. So the ISF materials that we have um, that will be going live um, in the public domain on the 27th of February are the following three on the screen. So on the left hand side we have the full report, it's about 30 pages outlining the ISF approach of how to run cybersecurity exercises. The center spherical diagram in the, in the middle is our cyber attack scenario builder which members or the, the public will soon be able to, to use is basically a diagram using the cyber attack chain where um, individuals can plot how a cyber attack will unfold and, and you'll, you'll see later in the presentation how useful that, that exercise is when creating a playbook for set cybersecurity exercise. And then the final piece of material on the right hand side is the ISF cybersecurity exercise planner which is, uh, it, it is exactly what it says on the tin really, it's a planner for, for members or the public that people can fill in and socialize amongst um, individuals that are going to be involved in the exercise um, throughout their organization. So, introducing cybersecurity exercises. As I briefly alluded to, um, we don't really have a, a common definition for cybersecurity exercises. They can, in fact, take a number of forms. The most popular, though, are the, the five uh, on screen here. So, I'll, I'll do a short introduction into all five. Um, so, tabletop simulations, They're, they are basically hypothetical group exercises 
they're typically paper based um, and then they're not really ever run without uh, with sorry with uh, with the use of live infrastructure or the requirement of a, a simulation center which is the key difference between tabletop simulations and digital simulations digital simulations however are group exercise run in simulated or test environments um, the key difference there is the is the digitization of the simulation a tabletop will be paper based in a room perhaps the size of a boardroom or can even be run amongst 200 300 people but it won't really involve live in infrastructure or real real uh, uh, the necessity of, uh, of digital platforms to run the third in the list here is red and blue teaming so uh, red and blue teaming is is perceived by many people as a form of cybersecurity exercise and it basically tests an organization's ability to defend against a group of determined attackers and it's split into two teams the red team often an external party uh, plays the role of the attacker and the blue team uh, typically the internal defense team plays the role of the defender which aims to protect against the attacks by investigating and responding to any threats posed by the red team the final point uh, final two here sorry are the penetration testing which is typically focusing on breaking into systems and exploiting vulnerabilities um, it's basically the red team side of red and blue teaming, but there is no real blue team in a penetration test. Um, and the final piece here is phishing exercises, which basically test employees' ability to detect fake emails and an organization's ability to respond uh, to these successful kind of phishing attacks is, uh, is what phishing exercises are. The bulk of the, the presentation is going to be focusing on how to run tabletop and digital simulations. However, many of the learnings can apply to the rest of the, uh, the exercises in the list on this, on this page here. But some of the key takeaways, a quote on the right hand side of the page, that simulated tests can and do dramatically inc increase the skills of individuals in an organization so they can meet the increasing complexity and volume of real life threats. So moving on. So what is the, the need to run cybersecurity exercises? So in the introduction, I briefly alluded to the fact that organizations are constantly under attack by real cyber attacks. And organizations that we have interviewed perform cybersecurity exercises of differing levels, differing complexities, for a range of reasons. Number one, imminent cyber attack. So organizations may discover or be informed through threat intelligence or other platforms that a particular cyber attack is imminent in which case organizational leaders may demand that the organization tests their ability to uh, handle this kind of attack. It gives them a, an outline of, of how prepared they are and what they would actually do should this cyber attack come to fruition. The second point here is about newsworthy cyber incidents. So we may see in the media um, that there has been an incident that has affected a competitor or another organization of, uh, of similar stature and the organization might demand that a cybersecurity exercise emulating this attack should be run to see how we, our organization, should um, handle this one. So, the third point here, restructuring of business operations and recent mergers, acquisitions or ventures, they're very closely linked. It's, it's basically when you restructure an organization or undergo an operational uh, change, it could be driven by a strategic initiative or say when leadership changes hands there will be teams processes technical infrastructure that will be changed uh, during this uh, evolution and cybersecurity exercises can test how these new uh, these new divisions these organizational structures will cope with a cyber attack the fourth on the right hand side um, the support for critical national infrastructure so many uh, organizations that support cni will often be required by the government specifically to take part in cybersecurity exercises or run their own and report the findings back to the government. And the final two here, legal or regulatory requirements. So there are, as I alluded to, there are government-led initiatives or regulatory uh, initiatives that in, uh, stipulate that organizations must perform particular types of cybersecurity exercises to actually demonstrate that they are wholly prepared to defend against common cyber attacks. For example, there are there may be um, organizations that underpin many other businesses or actual consumers and the government or regulators must know that these kind of organizations are wholly prepared for the onset of cyber attacks. 
And the final point here is contractual obligations. Organisations may actually have contracts written in um, from suppliers, vendors, clients to actually be involved in these uh, kind of group cybersecurity exercises. So, moving on, the benefits of running cybersecurity exercises. For me, I am totally behind the running of cybersecurity exercises. We've seen through our research and collaboration and uh, talking to members and other organisations that there are a range of benefits that organisations can have by running them. So, number one, it's, it's, it's entirely really about understanding how your people, your processes, your technology can respond to cyber attacks. What is going to happen if we are hit by a DDoS attack or a sophisticated cyber attack, this kind of thing. And then once you know what your current situation is, it will, the, the findings will basically enable you to improve your ability to detect, investigate, and respond to these kind of cyber attacks. And a byproduct of that is the second point here. You can know where to, where to train employees, um, in, improve awareness, such as uh, the, the phishing campaigns, and then give guidance to, to people that are actually responsible for preparing and preventing cyber attacks. And the third point here is, as I alluded to, the technology piece. Exercises run on digital platforms or even tabletop may identify control weaknesses and technical vulnerabilities that can be patched or remediated off the back of the uh, results of a cybersecurity exercise. And yes, the key to, to realising these benefits is the ISF approach, really. It's the preparation, the running, and the diligent following up of the results of the cybersecurity exercise. So, at a high level, what are the roles and responsibilities for individuals actually involved in cybersecurity exercises? It, it's pivotal to outline who does what before we embark on running a cybersecurity exercise. The first is the sponsor. The sponsor doesn't tend to actually get involved in the exercise, but they are typically the person who holds responsibility for the parts of the business, the parts of the organization that will be tested during the running of the cyber exercise. This may be the CTO, the CIO, a business unit manager or board member that actually champions an exercise or a program of exercises. But they may not be directly involved on the day and they leave most of the responsibility to the exercise controller, the, uh, the man or woman in the bottom left, the exercise controller, which is often an information security manager, a risk manager or equivalent, and they oversee all aspects of the exercise. They provide direction, they scope out the narrative of the exercise, they delegate responsibility, and they liaise with the facilitators who actually run the exercise on the day. So the facilitators, they're probably one of the most important uh, individuals on the day of the exercise, and they, they run the exercise in line with objectives, adhere to guidelines such as playbooks, they deliver the, uh, the actual narrative of the exercise, uh, they record all key issues, um, evaluate performance, and they basically liaise with the exercise controller at the end of the exercise to create action plans. What are we going to do to improve our current situation? So, the ISF approach, this is going to be the bulk of my presentation. Now you have a, an idea of who kind of does what during the ex exercise. Um, the next piece here is the ISF approach. So, preparing, running, and following up on the cybersecurity exercise. So phase A, prepare. So the, the list here I'll take you through um, from left to right, the key elements of preparation. So at the beginning of the exercise, beginning of the preparation, you select a target. You must then assess constraints. What can we do? What budget do we have? The next piece there is actually designing the cyber attack scenario. What kind of cyber attack are we going to, to run to test our organization? And once you've kind of done this, you can then choose the type of exercise you want to run. Do we have budget or the people available to run a tabletop exercise or a digital exercise or a phishing campaign, that kind of thing. And once you have those high-level uh, preparation steps in place, you can then make logistical arrangements, define what is success, and then you can build the playbook, so what the actual narrative of the exercise is going to be on the day. So selecting the target of the exercise. The target is highly important because it can be absolutely anything. It can be uh, anything in the asset model that we have here on the right-hand side of the page. It could be uh, focused on testing a piece of uh, uh, a business application. 
such as um, a booking system, a customer relationship management system, or an inventory management system, or any kind of technical infrastructure might be the target of the cyber attack. Or it may be physical devices, such as stealing or compromising laptops, or tablets or smartphones. Or it could be wholly targeted at the people. What divisions, what teams are we focusing on testing during this exercise? Or it could even be a location. It could be trying to access a uh, physical uh, office or a factory or a retail property or data center. It's these kind of discussions. What is going to be involved on the day of the exercise? What are we really trying to get out of testing here? And then, as I briefly alluded to in the introduction there, the, you have to assess your constraints. How much time do we have? How much resource, skills, budget do we have? What is achievable? Who is available? What people do we have? Um, and if there's any regulatory or legal restrictions that, uh, that may prevent the testing of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity exercise between jurisdictions. And then the final piece there is, we might not genuinely have a ready-made technical environment to actually do a, uh, a digital um, exercise. We may only have the capabilities or the facilities to run a tabletop. It's this kind of thinking that you need to have before you uh, embark on the exercise. So the next piece here is probably the most uh, fun element of the uh, preparation section of uh, running a cybersecurity exercise is the designing of a cyber attack scenario. And the way we've done this, the, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the uh, presentation, the ISF has created a cyber attack scenario builder, which uses the concept of the cyber attack chain to link uh, adversarial threat events together in order to build out a cyber attack that you can run during a cyber exercise. And I'll briefly show you what the scenario builder looks like. And this will be made available, all of these materials will be made available on the 27th of February for non-members. Um, I've just seen a question come through asking that. So yes, 27th of February. So an example here on the screen is how one might use the scenario builder to build out a, uh, an actual cyber attack. So we start out at the reconnaissance phase and we weave our way through to the uh, compromising of information. And this could be anything. This could be scanning accessible uh, networks. This could be uh, performing reconnaissance on a physical building and then we kind of move our way in there to actually exploit the information and this could turn into any kind of cyber attack that you want it to be. It can be highly tailored, it can be whatever kind of attack you want it to be. So once you have a high level idea of what kind of cyber attack you might want to run, this may be completely sophisticated. It might not just be one kind of uh, attack that's running, it may be a physical bomb um, alongside some sort of DDoS attack, alongside a malware attack, it could be as sophisticated as you want. But once you have an idea of the overall narrative of the exercise, you can then choose the type of exercise that you wish to run. So the list on the left-hand side should be relatively similar, or is exactly the same, sorry, as the, uh, the list at the beginning of the um, presentation. So we have tabletops, digital simulations, red and blue teaming, pen testing, and phishing exercises. And we've broken it down to a rough time scale, budget required, resourcing required, and technical environments required um, to actually do one of these, uh, these exercises. So this, um, this presentation will be on uh, Bright Talk later for those who want to actually um, deep dive further into this, um, this document here. But I'm going to swiftly move on to the next slide. Once you've decided what kind of exercise you want to run, you can then make the, the logistical arrangements, the logistical aspects that cannot be overlooked before you run an exercise. So if I start at the, the middle, you might, uh, to the left, sorry, you've got to book rooms and equipment. You've got to think, if we're running an exercise that involves 20 people, we need a, a boardroom style room with access to um, a television screen, um, with access to mobile phones, this kind of stuff. Then you can make travel arrangements. If you're running a digital simulation on a off-site premise, you need to actually do that. Um, scheduling dates. Um, you've got to get it into the diary, you've got to be able to socialise this exercise amongst everyone who's involved. And that's an important point there, you have to assign roles and responsibilities. We need to know who's sponsoring this exercise, we need to know who's in charge, who is the exercise controller, and who are the key participants. And once you know that, you can plan the activities and related timelines. And if you need external specialists, that's the point when you bring them in. So. The next step here is about defining success criteria. 
We can run an exercise and we can do it uh, in a kind of laissez-faire fashion, or we can define what success look lo looks like. And this is basically assessing the participant's ability to make decisions, um, what do they do during the exercise? Do they contact relevant stakeholders? Do we escalate serious issues? What do they do when they're met with a, with a DDoS attack? Or what do they do when they're met with a, um, a malware attack? Can they complete tasks in an orderly, timely manner? So once you've defined what success look like, looks like and you know what you want to do, you can leverage the, uh, the cyber attack scenario that you've been building out using the scenario builder to build a playbook. Now a playbook is what you use on the day. The exercise controller and the facilitators, this is like their Bible. This is what the storyline is um, for the uh, cyber attack or cyber security exercise. So a playbook has steps taken by the facilitator. So what does the facilitator do to enable the exercise? Alongside this, they have expected actions to be taken by the participants. What do we expect the participants to do when we give them this new piece of information? What do we expect from them? And this is usually tied in quite nicely to the success criteria. What do we expect our participants to do during the cyber attack? The next piece here is, is the injects. So injects um, is a quite a colloquial term really in, uh, in information security, but it's basically a method of introducing new information to um, to change the narrative of the exercise. So this could be anything from a, an announcement from the facilitator, it could be a phone call, it could be an electronic communication such as an email, a text or a tweet, um, or you could be breaking news on screen. It could uh, be something that pops up on the screen mid-exercise that changes the narrative, changes the cyber attack, changes the information that is perceived by the participants. And finally here, when you're creating this playbook, you're, you're leveraging the scenario that you've built here, the kind of cyber attack. And there are many kind of tactics that you can see here. You could use things such as diversion tactics, which are frequently used in the real world by um, attackers to distract defenders. So this is things like um, saying that there is a, uh, an attack that's taking place that actually isn't taking place. It's kind of heightening the chaos in the room. The second piece we could do is something like fake news. It's the deliberate spreading of misinformation or rumours or hoaxes that, yeah, again, ramp up the chaos in the room. It puts, it, it, it mimics what a real, real life cyber attack is really like in the real world. So once you've built your playbook, you can move on to actually running the exercise. So the most important thing before you run it really is briefing the participants. So what is going to happen on the day? The exercise controllers and the facilitators should diligently prepare what information they are and are not going to give to the participants in order to get the best out of their response and best test what uh, their response is during an, a real life cyber attack. So you have to outline the objectives, the timescales, how long is the ex exercise going to last. And in, things, um, in exercises such as digital simulations or red and blue team, it's important, highly important, to outline the boundaries of the test. We don't want to uh, encroach on areas of the business that are critical. We don't want to run or fake an attack on a core service or product that the business is fully dependent upon. And then there's applicable protocols such as who, who do you need to communicate to, um, who aren't you allowed to talk to, and there's other organizational processes such as cyber attack handling processes that may already be in play. So the second part here is making sure that you get across to the participants and to the facilitators that all actions need to be recorded. All of these actions will be used during the later phase of review. So it's understanding decisions made, any consequences, any issues identified during the exercise, and you need to kind of triage this through uh, assessing the severity and classifying what kind of cyber attacks took place, how long did it take us to uh, remediate this, this attack, what did we do? Everything needs to be um, uh, written down for uh, review at a later date. So on the day, everyone's in the room, you brief them, you can then start the exercise. So as I mentioned, injects, this could begin with a news flash, a telephone call, a SOC report. It can be as subtle as you would like it to be, or it could be as chaotic 
as you like it to be. It fully depends on the kind of attack you want it to be. And then you use the, the playbook to add injects at planned intervals. And the narrative of the exercise should already be developed. This should follow the, the, the scenario that you've built, following the, the kind of tactics that you've leveraged in the playbook, and then it should roll smoothly out. So during the facilitation, facilitators should not really ever offer assistance unless it's essential to do so. You want to see, you want to understand what the participant's true response is. You don't want to offer any guidance unless it is genuinely essential to do so, uh, just in case the, the exercise is stalled or the participants don't actually know what to do. Then you can jump in and help. But ideally, you just want to understand what are our people going to do um, during a real, real life attack. So the three kind of pillars here are detect. So detecting the, the, uh, the injects, facilitators, if um, the participants, sorry, do not understand what is going on, they don't actually understand there's an attack in place, then facilitators can highlight maybe anomalous behavior. They can run them through a SOC report. They can explain that there has been some form of attack in a certain part of the, uh, of the building or um, explain um, a bit more clearly what is going on. That might help the participants detect the cyber attack. The second point here is, and probably the most important, is actually investigating. Participants need to investigate the attack. What is happening? What kind of cyber attack is unfolding here? And they can do that by triaging. Um, they can categorize the attack, classify its severity, assign investigation to relevant individuals, and basically deal with the attack uh, as they see fit. The third point here is respond. So once you know what kind of attack is taking place, you've triaged it, then participants should develop suitable action plans, uh, review current cyber attack handling policies and procedures in order to know what we need to do to remediate this attack. They can even create holding statements. So you can, uh, you can fake a, uh, a someone from, the, the, um, from a media outlet ringing the organization asking for a, for a holding statement. It's, that's something that would happen in the real world. So why don't you do that? And the, third, the, uh, the final point here, sorry, um, is guiding towards specialists. Do they communicate with people in the business that are specialized in dealing with cyber attacks? The forensics guys, the incident response guys. It's pointing these participants in the right direction for, for how um, they should actually uh, deal with this attack in the real world. So once the exercise is over and done with, you've gone through the entire playbook. This could last um, from anywhere from a few hours through to uh, a couple of weeks or maybe even a few months if it's a, an ongoing phishing campaign. But then you end the exercise. You must immediately gather feedback. And as I mentioned at the beginning, all recordings, um, all findings, sorry, must have been recorded. This is highly important um, for the review phase, um, outlining the main issues raised. What did the participants do badly? But also, what did they do well? It's not a, a doom and gloom um, effort. It's, uh, it's basically giving the exercise controllers a platform to improve or remediate their people, processes, and technologies off of the back of the exercise. So phase C, the final phase, is the follow-up. So this is basically you need to conduct an exercise review. You need to take all of the information received during the exercise and review it. Review what the participants did well. You may evaluate their ability to detect the cyber attack, um, determine the actual scope and impact of the attack that it had on your business. Um, how did they triage, investigate, respond to the attack? Did they protect sensitive information? Um, did they make the right decisions? Did they follow instructions? Um, everything that has been recorded will be a good indicator of what the organization needs to do to, to improve their ability to handle these cyber attacks. So once you've performed this review, it influences the creation of action plans. So action plans, um, exercise controllers should determine whether these action plans should actually include training individuals to handle cyber attacks more effectively, updating cyber attack handling uh, and incident response procedures. Is there any, any kind of procedure or process that they followed that was inadequate for dealing with a real life cyber attack? Is there anything that we need to change or manipulate for us to be better prepared for handling the real life cyber attack? So 
once you've done this, you can you can take these action plans to uh, enhance existing security controls or by introducing new ones. Were there any kind of technologies that were inadequate, that were inadequate, in, inadequately prepared to deal with a, a DDoS attack or a malware attack or any kind of sophisticated cyber attack that has occurred um, during this um, cybersecurity exercise? And this will give an indication of where we need to improve. So is there a new software or technical infrastructure that we need to invest in to prepare ourselves for the onset of a real-life cyber attack? So once you have these, these action plans, it's highly important to present the key findings back to internal and external stakeholders that are responsible for the people, the processes, and the technologies that have been influenced or impacted by this, uh, this fake cyber attack during this cyber exercise. So ideally, you need to present the findings to the stakeholders in a timely, uh, concise manner. And it needs to be highly confidential. These are essentially the keys to the kingdom, the, the means of getting into your organization. You have to think about it in that way. Um, so you can, you can uh, report this to the re relevant external parties. This may be regulators, government bodies, um, suppliers, maybe even clients, if this was a contractual agreement. Um, but it's highly important to uh, consider the requirements of the individual stakeholders. Um, what were the objectives of the exercise at the beginning? What did we need to prove um, during this exercise? What was the success criteria? And then once you've uh, considered this, you need to, to look at the suitability and the achievability of the pr proposed action plans. Do we have budget? Do we have the people um, in place to improve our current ability to handle these, uh, these fake cyber attacks? So, after this, you implement the action plans. So, you take the key findings once they've been approved by these internal and external stakeholders. You can allocate a, uh, a, uh, an action um, to a responsible individual. Um, you can assign a priority and a deadline for the completion of these actions. So, we can plug holes, patch, patch uh, software that was uh, poorly secured, or train individuals in a timely manner so that they can be better prepared for a real cyber attack. Then you can allocate budget and resource to perform these actions, and then you can monitor these actions over time to see if they've been completed in a timely manner. Another thing that, that can be done here is taking these action plans to revise the way that these cyber exercises are running in the future. You can do this by determining whether they should be run in isolation, or maybe even part of a, a wider testing program over time. You may find that running an exercise every six months, every six months, sorry, to, to assess whether the organization has improved their ability to handle cyber attacks. It'd be a good indication of that. So that is the end of my presentation here. I've, I've wrapped it up at about the 35 minute mark. Um, I'll just take you through some of the key takeaways though. Uh, to leave you with something before we go and assess the um, the questions that have come through here. Um, so the key takeaways. So any organization can run a cybersecurity exercise. You don't need a, a huge budget. You don't need a lot of people. You don't need a, a massive amount of time to run these exercises. They, these can be run from anywhere between a few hours up up to a few months, really, depending on how detailed you want to run it. But it, it, it doesn't have to be a digital simulation each time. It doesn't have to be an expensive red teaming exercise. It can be a simple, cheap, tabletop exercise that truly assesses the organization's ability to handle these cyber attacks. How do they communicate with the wider community? How do they communicate with, um, with the police? That kind of thing. The second point is that you can't just run an exercise um, off of a whim. You need to diligently prepare, run, and follow up on the results. The key point is following up on the results. You may find um, points here that you will need to remediate, that you need to do in a, in a timely, effective manner. But those that run cybersecurity exercises and diligently uh, follow up on the, the results will be better positioned over time to deal with a range of real-life cyber attacks. It's, it's, uh, it's basically preparing um, before it's being proactive instead of reactive, basically. It's uh, preparing oneself for the onset of a real-life cyber attack before it happens. And the third point here is, it's not just understanding 
how the people will, will, uh, will respond to a cyber attack. It may actually expose overlooked security holes. Um, it may, you may find um, issues in, in processes or weak systems um, or technologies that, um, that may be uh, wholly inadequate for the onset of a real-life cyber attack. It's not just the, uh, the people element here. So that wraps it up really for me um, in terms of the, uh, the presentation. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I'll leave the line open for around uh, eight or nine minutes to take any questions. Um, I've got one here that I can run through quickly. What types of platforms do you use for the digital simulations? So digital simulations can be run, um, they tend to be run by external parties. It's, it's, uh, it's something that's quite expensive to do, if, if I'm being completely honest. Um, so if we if we look at the the diagram of the uh, the uh, the table really digital simulations they they yes they are they require a lot of budget they require a lot of resource really um, but where do you do it really um, well one that I've seen was the IBM Cyber Range um, that was one that we had the uh, the pleasure of attending and it kind of ramps up the it can mimic really um, what a real life uh, um, attack looks like by uh, mimicking your your software your technology um, but they're, they're not the only kind of players in the market there there's a range of other um, external providers but you can run a digital simulation by um, by mimicking or creating kind of a uh, a sandbox style environment or mimicking exactly what your software or technology looks like and then running the attack on that so you don't actually run it on live infrastructure it's that kind of kind of, uh, of way of doing it um, so I've got one there. Can you provide rough costs for each of the exercise types? So yes. So if um, I'm not, I'm not going to jump back to the uh, the slide deck because it will take too long to to click back whole, the whole way. But I'll give you a high level overview of the different types of exercises and the budget required. Um, so tabletop simulations, they are very very cheap, if if not negligible. All you need really is the, the time of the individual or the exercise controller and facilitators that are going to plan the tabletop. You don't really have to invest or pay for a contractor or somebody to come in to facilitate if you can do so uh, within your organization. So the exercise controller might be the information risk manager or uh, the kind of CIO, CTO, who is going to prepare, diligently prepare this exercise. And this, this doesn't, doesn't cost a lot of money whatsoever. Um, digital simulations tend to be a lot more expensive, as does red and blue teaming. Um, pen testing really depends on how long they're going to be uh, penetrating your, your systems, really, um, to see how much money it's actually going to cost. And then fishing exercises, that varies, really. It depends how long the fishing campaign lasts for. So, um, any more questions? Any real-life case studies of exercises that have happened and an explanation as to why they were undertaken. Okay, any real life case studies of exercises? So, uh, I can't give exact names of organizations or the members that, that um, I interviewed for, uh, for this report, but there have been many uh, exercises that I've, I've seen. One of the um, most interesting that I saw was a, uh, uh, one of the airline industry, um, airline organizations, sorry, um, within our membership, that ran an extended exercise. It was it was kind of a hybrid uh, tabletop digital simulation that um, ran for about two or three weeks. And they basically uh, would send kind of phishing emails to employees stating that they'd been hacked. And um, they ramped this up over time. It was a it was a it was a long game. And um, they basically explained how a senior executive had. Uh, had their their details stolen, and it kind of the, the the scenario changed over time. But it was a, a highly tailored example. And I mean, we've spoken to a a range of organisations across a range of industries. It's not just the airline industry that does this. It's uh, it's the financial industry. It's the um, it's the any kind of player could undertake this. It's not necessarily um, difficult to to run a tabletop or a digital simulation, which is a probably a, a common misconception um, that people may think. Um, so, can you give some pros and cons for facilitating the exercise internally 
versus using a third party service provider. Well, I think one of the, the important points here for using a third party is that a lot of the effort is moved into kind of their responsibility. Facilitating an exercise internally, it's, it is a, an, a, an, a difficult undertaking, really. It takes a lot of time, effort, but though the time and effort you put in is often rewarded highly. And third, using third-party providers is very expensive. I'd say that's one of the, the, the downsides, really. But uh, running one internally does take a significant effort and, uh, and time, really, to run um, an internal cybersecurity exercise. Um, the final question I have there, uh, is there any standard methodology or best practice for running tabletop exercises which can be adapted to a given organization? Um, that's a difficult one. I think I, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head um, if there's any kind of standard out there for running tabletop exercises. Um, uh, yeah, that'd be something that I think should be developed, really. It, there should be a kind of common platform or, or way of um, producing these exercises, really. But, I mean, the, the, the platform that we have at the ISF, which is going live on the 27th um, of fe February, uh, provides the, a planner, it provides the cyber attack scenario builder, and the report that can all be used to develop and run um, successful cybersecurity exercises. And the entire point of the membership um, platform that we have is so members can really share best practice. They can they can talk to each other in a confidential manner um, and network and ask each other what went well, what went wrong. It's leveraging the the kind of the, and collaborating with organisations and businesses that have done these things, so you can take uh, the key snippets of information from them to run your own. Uh, the final one here: Could you sum up what are the main barriers? To delivering a successful cybersecurity exercise, I'd say the main barriers here is internal politics. If I'm completely honest, it's getting everybody on the same page. It's getting people from the finance division, from the marketing division, from uh, from the board, um, from incident response, all involved in a in a, in a wider um, uh, exercise. And, and it's timing, really. It's everybody can can uh, can relate to the fact that. Many parts of the business are inherently very, very busy, and finding the time to run a, a fake cyber attack doesn't tend to be on the, the forefront of, uh, of the board's mind. But what we're hoping is that you, uh, this is going to change over time. I mean, we're seeing cyber attacks happening um, more and more frequently, and cybersecurity exercises, simulation, scenario planning is proving to be uh, a means of uh, preparing um, organizations for the onset of cyber attacks better than ever before. So we're hoping that that this is uh, moving towards the um, the forefront of the board's mind. And when it when that does happen, there'll be significantly more budget, more investment, and these things and these uh, kind of means of running exercises um, will become more popular and more easy to do. So that is uh, almost uh, time up. Really, we've got about 30 seconds left. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. The, um, the presentation will be added to Bright Talk. It has been recorded, so you can access that. ISF members on the line, you can um, access ISF Live to download the full report, the scenario planner, and the uh, cyber attack um, uh, scenario planner as well, sorry. And for those who are not members, the reports and the rest of the, the documents will be going live um, uh, to the public on the 27th of February. So thank you very much for your time um, and goodbye.